Hi, everyone. My name is Sean Speakman. I am the author of The Dark Thorn and the upcoming The King Killing Queen, which will be out this October, although you can support my Kickstarter in April if you so choose. Oh, did I say that date? Oh, I, I just changed the date, didn't I? Hmm, I might have to talk about that later. About <laughs> with me is, of course, the legendary, the handsome, the, the intriguingly smart, and always uh, deferential Terry Brooks. Hi, Terry. Yeah, don't stop now. Keep going. You're on a roll there. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Don, and uh, very nice to be here to talk uh, once again about what's going on in the Brooks writing world, uh, which is mostly me writing constantly and never getting a break. So uh, that's starting to wear me down a bit. This gives me a break now to come on and let you talk for the most right. part. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Terry kind of opened it up right there, and I will, I will say this just really quickly. Uh, we are accepting questions. So um, actually, we aren't. I mean, you can ask me anything you want, anytime you want. But uh, we got Terry here. So definitely direct your, uh, your questions to Terry in the Q&A. And he will do his best job of answering. And uh, as those questions start popping up in the field over there, Terry and I are revealing the limited edition and the lettered edition and the regular hardcover of the Druid of Shanra. This is a um, project of love, I think, on both of our behalves. It's been yeah. 30 years since the Heritage of Shannara series published. So it's a great anniversary. It's a great opportunity to like go back and read the books and, um, and offer new art to you guys. You know, artwork is something that in this business that we're in has kind of largely been taken out of the books, but because of Grim Oak. And Terry and I, uh, loving books as much as we do, we decided, you know what, it's time to do something with the Heritage series. And so last year, we shipped out copies of the Scions of Shannara and Indomitable with artwork by Mark's, uh, Mark Simonetti. And you guys all loved that book. So now we are, uh, we are ready to basically launch and take pre-orders for the Druid of Shannara, which we hired artist Lishan Nien. Um, he is a major Hollywood artist and uh, I was fortunate to get him I couldn't believe it. he's like I got a hole I got a hole right now in my schedule and, and so I sent some samples to Terry Terry liked his work and so he's been working on the artwork for the last uh, probably about seven months and yeah. that's where we're at uh, during this conversation you know we're of course going to take your questions which I see a couple in there already and so that so well done keep asking them because we want to fill up this hour as much as we can but um, we will also announce the, uh, the pre-order date that you guys will be able to pre-order from the signed page. We're not doing a Kickstarter this time. We felt pretty confident in what we did with the first Kickstarter. And we thought, why, why do we need Kickstarter? You guys came through on Kickstarter. And so now it's just, it's just gonna be on the signed page. So it's gonna be easy, easy to order. Uh, let's see, what are people saying here? Let's see if anybody's saying anything here. All right, make sure it's not in the chat. Are they behaving themselves out there? Mostly, mostly, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see, Robert Dixon said something nice. I would like to start by saying this is an amazing visit to offer your fans, right? We, you love talking to your fans, right? I mean, that's one of your favorite things. Has been for almost 50 years. <laughs> Yes, I do like talking with my fans. Um, it is my favorite way of communicating uh, in general. Uh, I don't get out as much as I used to anymore, although I still get out again several, three times, four times a year. Uh, but I don't, I'm not very good with social media. Uh, and my time limits these days are constrained by the fact that I'm getting old enough uh, that working a full day means about six hours and then I'm all done and uh, I've lapsed into the horrific uh, practice of reading other books uh, terrible which, which is terrible no which is great because I'm seeing so many new authors and following so much of what's out there that I might not have even gotten to before uh, and uh, my current status is that I work till three in the afternoon and then quit and uh, the rest of the time after that I uh, tend to read uh, whatever, you know, is, is out there. Julian and I both do. It's become a joint marital experience for us. 
That's great. Yeah. I just realized and I'm supposed to be streaming this on Facebook too. So I need to take care of that. Yes, that's yes. probably probably kind of important. The Facebook people are probably sensed by now. They are. They for sure are. Let's see what I can do here. See if I can get get into the right spot. No, we don't want to share this on Bella Red Salon, no matter how much Chris <laughs> find that funny. <laughs> Yeah, we're we're a classified operation here. That's right. Yeah. All right. So that's uh, Facebook and Zoom are talking to one another now, and they're to loading. So. Okay. Wait a minute. I gotta hit. Got it. Okay. Got it. Let's see if it'll work. <clears throat> You'd think is, as many years as we've been doing this, we'd have it down to a fine art, but I guess it's not possible. I, I was just going to say that, like, <laughs> wait a minute, that's not yeah. what to do to permissions. Ah, strange. Why isn't it? It doesn't, it does not like me. Let me see if I can it's do It's funny, it. back in the old days, I could remember uh, doing a huge number of radio shows, um, frequently late at night in undesirable places. With strange <laughs> okay. people. Uh, and uh, th there was always a kind of a uh, sensibility on the part of the interviewers that, are you for real? Uh, what's this fantasy nonsense? What, what, <laughs> right. Where did you come up with this? Come on, tell me now. And we would talk about it and they would say, and people read this dribble? And uh, <laughs> right. you know, I, would, I would say perfectly straight faced, yes, they do. And they <laughs> like it too. Right. Uh, but um, I can remember so many of those interviews looking back on them. And uh, that was about the only way I did any communication, except with the occasional uh, spot check on a uh, television show that came on right between the weather and the sports, uh, you know, where some kind of one minute interview was, a, was uh, the road of the day in governing a book. It satisfied the literary crowd, I'm sure. <laughs> right. So um, now I, I don't do hardly any of that sort of thing. I do these, uh, our Zoom things, and I do uh, the occasional TV show, but mostly um, I just show up at events or go to book signings and, and do it that way, which is the way I prefer anyway. Right. You got Emerald City Comic Con coming up. That's, that's kind of- I do. In the backyard, uh, I do. yeah. That's going to, you're going to be there. Uh, you and I are going to be doing a, one, one of these sets together for an hour and talking about what's happening out there in the world of fantasy. Uh, and I'm going to be doing two, three different signings and another panel or two. And uh, it's enough to keep me busy for the two days I'm going to be there. So I'm looking forward to it. Haven't been to Emerald City now in three or four years, however long it's been going or if it's been going. Yeah, you missed, you missed last year. It was just Robin Hobb and I, uh, yeah. our, us poor souls that had to be alone and weather, <laughs> weather, weather the people there. Um, no, oh, you get along but, well. That's good. Yeah, Robin and I love each other. I, I she, she's one of my favorite people. So hey, who easy. doesn't like Robin? She's a really good person. She is. She's yeah. a great writer. All right. So I got things working now. So that's good. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's see here. Uh, so I don't know what I want to do here. How Should do you want to do this? Do you want to take questions at the end or do you want to do it in between? Well, let's talk a little bit more about what's up and coming and uh, for both of us here. That be that's always of some interest at least. Um, and I can talk a little bit about it to start things off. Um, yeah, sure. I'm in the process of, and I mean process, meaning I am literally one day, I think, maybe two days away from completing the rewrites on the book that will come out later this year that I can't say the title to, but which is the third book in the Child of Light series. And uh, for the moment, at least, is going to wrap that up. Uh, it's been a tough writing for me. Um, I, uh, for various reasons, I was struggling with it and it, and I had to do some major rewrites, which hasn't happened in a while. Um, but now I think I've got a handle on it and um, I'm told that it will be coming out sometime in uh, early November, Great. as opposed to early October. But um, I'm pretty happy about the book and there's some surprises in there. Um, and I think that the storyline is going to appeal to a lot of people. And I've done something I've never done before, 
in conjunction with uh, the storytelling. Um, it's inventive in a new way. Um, I'm anxious to hear what people say about it and what they think about it. So pretty fired up about that. And then in the meantime, um, I am writing something else that I can't talk about, but that is, uh, oh, something I've been thinking about for a while. And I think uh, readers are going to be fairly pleased when uh, they see what it is. Yeah, I think so too. Um, mum is the word on that until later this year yeah, next year yeah. for that. Um, yeah, but you've been really busy. I mean, I've so been many more busy. Well, this whole COVID period, all I've done is write books, uh, which is, uh, you know, what I'm supposed to be doing anyway. <laughs> right. The pressure is there because there's nothing else to do, or not until recently, at least. And I haven't been going out anywhere. Of course, I've avoided COVID entirely, knock on wood. Yeah. Uh, and not been sick at all, uh, but uh, have uh, had an awful lot of time to do things. And when I have an awful lot of time to do things, a lot of it ends up being writing. Right. So I've tackled a couple different things and made some experiments and kind of stretched the limits on a couple things as well. Uh, still busy talking about uh, possible things to do with the Shannara series um, because those rights have come back. And uh, we have wrapped up the TV show entirely and we're off on a new direction. So hopefully have something to say about that in the near future, meaning sometime before I'm dead. Uh, <laughs> so we'll see what, what happens there. So talk about yourself now. You've got a bunch of stuff going on. I do, yeah. I'm I, uh, on the flight back. I, I, I flew down to Hollywood. Um, the last two days to do some work for Skybound Entertainment. They're the people that do The Walking Dead. And, and we've uh, joined this partnership where we're gonna be publishing my next novel together as, as partners, which is unique. It, that doesn't happen uh, in the publishing world, at least not what I've seen so far. And it's been a lot of fun because I, I, have, a, I have this partner that's down there that has this, these large divisions of not only a book division, but they have a graphic novel division, right? And they have a gaming division and they have uh, the TV film division. So um, it's opened my eyes a lot. I've seen a lot of, you know, the work that you've done over the years with Hollywood in various different capacities. And now I'm kind of thrown into it and I really don't want to be there. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Yeah, um, but uh, but it was fun. Yesterday I flew down and was interviewed for a couple hours about my new book, which is titled The King Killing Queen. And The King Killing Queen, I can actually share this now because it's out there. The King Killing Queen is a prequel to my first, what I consider my first real novel, The Dark Thorn, which, uh, you know, is an urban fantasy, in, in my opinion, very word and voidish in, in some in some respects. And uh, I was heavily influenced by your word and void trilogy. So that's where a lot of it came from. And uh, I guess I owe you royalties now for that, now that I've admitted that. <laughs> true. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. So the King Killing Queen is a, is a prequel to the Dark Thorn. And it originally wasn't, but I really wanted um, some the more I wrote it, the more I realized that it was connected, more than likely kind of like what happened with you and Armageddon's children, you know, it, it just it just mm -hmm. worked out that way when you were when I was writing. Mm -hmm. So uh, Skybound and I were publishing that novel, we're doing a Kickstarter. Uh, the Kickstarter will be uh, sometime next month, I do believe we have shifted our dates a little bit that will be announced uh, next week. But um, in the meantime, uh, you know, they're doing a graphic novel adaptation for a short story I wrote. That's a prequel to the prequel, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so it's been fun. Nate Taylor has been doing the artwork. He's Patrick Rothfuss's right hand man when it comes to illustrating. And so, and we'll see Nate. We're going to see Nate this weekend at Emerald City Comic Con. So I'm excited to see him and yeah. because the work that he's turning in on the graphic novel is phenomenal. So yeah, I'm super excited about all of that. And then on the flight back yesterday, I decided to write chapter one of the next book. So, you know, that's that's just kind of how it goes. You just get a fire lit under yeah. you and you write what you want. So, yeah. So does, uh, does all this uh, fanfare and uh, interest in your life mean you're moving to Hollywood? 
No, no. Are, are no. you going to go Hollywood on us? No uh, Hollywood. And, uh, no Hollywood. Check yourself in the Pacific Northwest. I know some writers that have left <laughs> have left where they're happy and moved to Hollywood, and they're yes. miserable. <laughs> I'll tell you, the number of writers that I know about that have done this who were successful as writers have not had the same kind of success in Hollywood. And I, I certainly can tell them why. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's pretty hard with... for a book person to make that shift over. Um, it is. And there's a lot of things that go into the process that uh, are anathema to those of us who basically work alone yes uh, all the time and like it that way yeah yeah th that's what was strange yesterday was i was surrounded by seven or eight people and uh you know and i like like you said we work in a very secluded you know situation as writers so i, I was yeah, almost yeah. like panicked about it you know <laughs> yeah i know so yeah, anyway tough. yeah so, well, so it's good training though because then when someone comes up to you and says can you give us a comment on the war in the ukraine You'll be ready to go right away because you'll have practiced this instant response to all situations. And you'll say, no, I don't have a thing to say about it. I, I, that'll I'm, be that. I, I'm used to keeping <laughs> to myself. Leave me alone outside world. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see here. So, but yeah, today. So yeah, so you are super busy. Um, I'm... I'm happy I didn't read your book yet, the newest book. I'm happy I didn't read that because you did rewrite the end of that book. So I did rewrite it entirely. Yeah. yeah so that's kind of that's kind of fun because now there's like two versions of the book out there. That's kind of neat. Um, well, there's probably more than that if you were to take all of the stuff I've thrown away on and off over the, the year it's taken me to write this thing. Right. And it's been something of a slog uh, of the uh, Foreign Legion across the Sahara type. And um, uh, it's been a while since I've had this kind of a struggle, and I hope it isn't symptomatic of where my career is going. But in <laughs> any case, uh, it's it's going to it's going to see its end here uh, uh, in the next couple of days, and then I can put it away and go back to work on something else for a while and regain my sanity. Do you think that uh, your editor's comments about it were right, and and the book is better for it? Of course not. I think she's totally <laughs> wrong. I told her, what are you doing? Uh, no, I always trust my editor and uh, almost with almost without exception these days, um, Angrove is right on the target every single time. So um, it doesn't do me any good to get, her, get out there and whine about how I'm being mistreated and so on and so forth, because first of all, I know it's not true. Right. And second of all, I realize that what's happening here is I'm getting the best help I can about how to make the book stronger. And that's the point of having a good editor, which uh, I feel lucky enough to have had over the years. Yeah. But Anne's very good about it. No, she makes it, she's very clear about what she thinks needs to happen, but she does it in a really nice way. So I can't get mad without seeming like some kind of a filch or something. Uh, so I have to avoid those kinds of tan temper tantrums and just <laughs> look at what needs doing and figure figure out the best way to do it. That's uh, that's what it's all about. Your your former editor Betsy Mitchell is my editor. Now. Yes, I know that. And, I know that. and we just uh, laugh and we laugh about you. I bet you do. <laughs> oh my God, he's such a terrible <laughs> writer. Why do I keep taking his money? It's so painful. No, uh, yeah, I had the opposite problem with with the King Killing Queen. Betsy Betsy said, you know. I understand why you wanted to start the book this way, super action packed, super fast, really get the reader involved, but you really need to add a chapter before it and really get us invested in the world first. And I'm like, all right. So I had to do yeah. kind of what you're doing. Like I had to rewrite those first couple chapters to make, yeah. make, because I totally believe her. Like there's no reason not to believe her. She's the expert. So she is, and she's very good. She was always, I always appreciated her. She worked on everything from uh, Armageddon's Children uh, forward to not the end of the uh, of the Shannara books, but to oh my gosh, through the main series there in the middle section. And uh, she was always very smart about what she said. That all of these people, the only trouble is, you know, it's there's 25 pages of notes every time I, I get through with a book. Yep. And I'm thinking, I'm not improving in, in, in any way that's noticeable. I seem to be stuck in 25 pages of, 
of uh, correctional uh, suggestions, whether uh, I have an easy time or a hard time. So I'm beginning to think maybe that just doesn't make any difference. You're just going to get that. And, you know, forget it. Just just live with it. Maybe the editor's contract with the publisher <laughs> that they have to give That's 25 pages of notes. Yeah, I, I have a feeling they sit down and they say and 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 says, well, I got Terry Brooks today for 25 pages. And Trisha <laughs> says, well, I got whoever uh, Naomi Novik for 125 pages, and that was single spaced and. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> And you're buying the drinks, Anne. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, there, there's a good question here that I'll just throw out to you from Craig Toe. He says, how long does it take you to write a book when you are rolling? Oh, well, the fastest book I ever wrote was the Star Wars book. I wrote that in 90 days. Um, but in that case, I had a pre-organized set of uh, notes regarding dialogue and setting and all of that. So that was easy. Uh, of my own work, I think the fastest book I ever wrote was Running with the Demon. Because that book, I, I wrote that in about four to five months. And I knew that story from start to finish from day one. Uh, wow. And I knew exactly the feeling I wanted to have. It was one of those magical times when everything comes together. And you don't have to spend a lot of time agonizing over whether to do this. I just knew what was supposed to happen all almost all the way through. I can't even remember a glitch I had in that book. Um, and I still think it's one of the strongest I ever wrote. So I guess it pays to try to get into that mode. Um, so that's probably the fastest I think I could do anything. These days, probably, I still write it about six months. It's about six months for me to write a book. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it goes a little bit longer. But uh, if you're talking about start to finish, uh, when I'm saying um, I come up with an idea, I start working on the idea, I start writing the idea as a book, and I finish it for a first draft. Uh, that's, you know, about a six month process. And then we get into revision work and so forth. Right. Yeah. Good question, Craig. Uh, let's see here. What else we got going on? Oh, this is this is an interesting question too. We might as well ask this question. And you're you're going to have to be cagey on this, probably. I would assume. <laughs> I'm good at that. This is my uh, lawyer in me is very cagey. I have a I, I have I have another answer that I can be even cagier than what you're going to be probably. <laughs> we'll, we'll see who's cagey cagey okay. here. Okay. Uh, Louis uh, Marotti asks on Terry's website. It states that Terry will release two books this year. Is that still happening? If so, when will we learn more about each book? Well, the answer to that is, as soon as I know, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, uh, no, the answer is no. There's only one book coming out this year. Yeah. And no, uh, I'll be cagey uh, about it. I'll say, going here. I'll now, say you're going to be two books because it's yeah. book three in the Viridian Deep series and it's the Druid of Shannara limited edition. Oh, that's, doing. <laughs> that's a great answer. You're right. That's right. I forgot about Druid of Shannara because it seems kind of like old hat having been out since 92. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. this new, this new uh, edition is so wonderful. I love what this is happening with these and, and how they're making them look so wonderful and so special. Uh, You're welcome. I'll take my bow. No, <laughs> it makes me feel like I have some, you know, some small quality in my work uh, that merits special attention. You know. Yeah. Well, you know, some of these images that we're going to show show from Druid today, I don't think you've seen the final versions. I, I think I sent you all the thumbnails for your initial. I think approval. you did, but I, you're right. I don't think I've seen any of the final editions. Um, yeah. Let's see here. Wow, a lot of chat, a lot of chat comments. Uh, I'm just going to say this again. If you have a question, drop it into the Q and A box. We have about, ooh, we have 30, 30 questions that are in there. So that's good. This is going to, what are you doing for dinner tonight? Is it going to be yeah, right. going to Taco Bell at seven o'clock? <laughs> no, I, uh, my wife is fixing it. I'm happy to report. Um, and we're having leftovers from last night. So nice. I know right now I'm getting it. All and right. then the big evening begins. Okay. Old episodes of Hill Street Blues. Oh, you are not. I am. <laughs> I love that show. All right. I have to hear more about Renko and yeah, the other and Belker and so forth. Yeah, I think Kristen and I just on our part, we're going to watch uh, the new Mandalorian episode that launched. Oh, is that just started again? Uh huh. Just started again today. So. Okay. Um, 
And that's something that I get to watch with the kids because both Soren and Kale love Grogu, the little Ooh. baby Yoda. Oh, well, the baby, baby Yoda, Yoda. yeah. <laughs> so it'll be a family night. It'll be a popcorn night. We haven't figured out if we've actually watched the end of the first series. You know, oh. we stopped watching it and then we went away. And when we came back, we couldn't remember where we stopped. Oh, yeah. Uh, how many episodes are there? Uh, I know? think there's 16. And then there's a couple in the Book of Boba Fett. And uh, I haven't I haven't seen 16. And the I end know. the end of season two of Mandalorian has one of the best character reveals of all time. So I'll just say that. And the people that are in the chat right now, they'll probably be saying the same thing. Like it's a scene that I've rewatched probably 50 times. Just probably just tell me it isn't another Marvel comic experience. Yes, Captain America just shows up out of the blue and <laughs> I knew it. I knew they were gonna do that. Oh my god. The MCU okay. is now Star Wars, Star Wars 2 included. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's show off. Let's show off the cover first. I, we've done it before, but let's show off the cover for this. Actually, you know what? I should probably open. I need to figure out what I want to show off here, first of all. I want to show that off. I want to show that off. Let's uh I won't show that. Not those, not those pictures of me in the shower, please. No, gosh, no, no, the image is burned in my head now. Oh burned in my head. <laughs> and not in a good way. I show that one. Oh, we'll show we'll show Karisman because I showing Karisman might be fun. Yes. Uh, I need to leave a couple of these out so yeah. that people have something to look forward to in the book. So I'm going to do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How seven images sound out of the 12 or 11? There we go. Okay, let's go. I'm going to put these in order. Oops, don't do that. Put these in order in some way that makes sense. All right, great. And then where is, oh no, let's see here. There we go. All right, so now I'm gonna share the screen. Okay, here comes the lovely, lovely cover by our artist friend, Lashen Yin. I'm gonna share the screen. Ah, uh, yeah, I remember this. There you go. Great cover. All right, so here is the cover. Um, From atop the walls. Yeah, in Eldwist. So when we, initially, when we initially talked about the cover and what you wanted, you pretty yeah. much said, we need to show a couple of the characters at least, and it needs to be different than the original Druid, which is, this is my original copy, by the way. I'm going to say a couple words about this real quick because uh, I grew up in a very poor family and my mother bought me scions in hardback and she price clipped it so my father would not know how much a hardback book cost <laughs> in 1990 or 1991, whatever it was. And if I remember right, it was 1999 or something for a hardback book back then. Gosh, yes. Um, I love the, moment, the moment I got this copy... I read it in probably two days. Yeah. I loved the cover. I fell in love with the cover immediately. The Keith Parkinson artwork is amazing. That cover got a lot of uh, response. Uh, a lot of people loved it and some people thought it was wrong. Yeah. Um, but it, it was, it did, it, it, it did generated a lot of discussion. And uh, I, to this day, I, it's one of my favorite covers because it's so contrary to the nature of the story. Yeah, and uh, so contrary. And so contrary to what fantasy covers were doing in the early yeah at that years. time particularly because they were always sword and swordsman, you know the and the fair maiden and whatever yeah it was exactly very standardized and uh, I didn't I didn't care for those as much yeah exactly I used to uh, you know I would get my my monthly allowance which back then was twenty dollars and that was big money back then yeah and I would exactly. I would put my twenty dollars um, in in that copy of Druid of Shannara. And uh, so that was 91. When I went to college in the late 90s, um, I brought my books with me and I found multiple $20 bills in there. It was like a gift to myself. <laughs> <laughs> Your college education, spend it for fun. Yes, yeah, I, was, I was already yeah. prepping. 
Uh, but for the cover of the limited edition here, you you requested just two things. One, that it would be different than the scene that was on the original hardcover, yeah. and two, that it would showcase a couple uh, a couple of the characters. Great characters, yeah. And so I asked you, you know, what, what do you think, like highlighting Eldwist would make sense? And you said, sure, do it. You know, you know how you are. Just yeah, go do it. Yeah. So here we have Eldwist, which is you know the stone city. Yep. City, a city that's been turned into stone and you have the Buried dome in the mountains. yeah you have the dome in the back but it's you know but now with foresight we know that this is the future of our world of our of yeah. our world that you you've tied it together since 1991 so yeah um you know when it comes to this do you think it it reflects what the world might have been be right before the great wars Oh, I think there's every reason to think it would look like something. Many of these uh, structures are immediately recognizable as something else that's going on in the world. Um, and the big spiral at the back with the arms is, a, is another good example of something that we've seen before. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's a good representation. Right, we got Walker there with the one arm. Yep, the Walker and uh, Payel. The assassin in the background and yep. uh quickening yeah quickening quickening looking a little different than i would have pictured her because i don't know what she's holding on to there uh, it's a flower she's holding a flower a petal. oh that's great yeah. that's exactly right because she came from the gardens exactly uh, yeah the garden and, yeah yeah, the artist okay. asked me about that when he read when he read the opening chapter of Druid. He said we really need to tie her to organic somehow. We tie her to her organic beginnings, and so that's what he right. chose to do. And I was like, "Do it! That's a great idea." Yeah, I I'm, I like that too. He he has some foresight on that one. That's the kind of contrast I like to see in these things. Here's a dark world. Looks like everything's been destroyed, and then you have uh, a beautiful woman holding a flower. And I think that's great. So I'm going to ask you a question here. Go ahead. No, I'm done. Okay. I'm going to ask you a question here that popped up in the chat, not into the regular thing here. But, <clears throat> and, you know, going back to being cagey, you've been cagey over the years when it comes to this question. Now it's a little bit more difficult for you to be cagey, but. Uh, Matthew, <laughs> I can't remember anything. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> yeah. Um, I can be real cagey. Matthew Clark asks, is Eldwest presumed to be Chicago, New York, somewhere else? What do you think? Um, well, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, the answer is that because the Four Lands is basically a replica of a part of the United States uh, in the Pacific Northwest and uh, in some of the country running to the east of there, um, this was always supposed to be Canada. Okay. And what we're looking at here is a major city in Canada because there was a lot of spillover and the old boundaries didn't exist anymore. Right. Uh, except for the mountains and so forth. So um, I envisioned it as being somewhere like Vancouver or one of the cities that uh, major cities up that way. Got it. Um, except that in this case, it was buried in the mountains uh, between a series of peaks. So it really wasn't exactly anything like like most of what I write about doesn't it isn't it's replications of things that occur to me at the time that it's never exactly any one thing. So it's a in your mind it's more of an amalgamation maybe of a couple yeah. cities that you've yeah. been to and more interesting that way. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's more interesting that way. Um, and, it, and, you know, people can sit here in the, in the chat and argue now to their heart's content which city it possibly could be. <laughs> yeah, the artist could tell us maybe. Uh, yeah, right, right, right. Put it back on him. I just, yeah, I just love, you know, you got the dome in the background and that's where the yeah. Stone King, you know, resides. And But you have this, this uh, more futuristic overarching aspect above the dome, which, yeah. I would love to see this done somehow in our world. That would be really, really cool. Would be Somebody will do it eventually in the future, but that's where this story takes place is the future. So. Yeah. 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 What else people you got? Chat, people in the chat are like, wowzers. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. I hope they like it. All right. Let's see here. Let me see if I can find, I want to pick. 
the signature page. So, you know, when, when it comes to doing a book like this, a limited edition, letter edition, uh, the signature page is actually really important because we actually print the signature pages early. So we have to have the art early and we, we send the signature pages to Terry and he signs them and then the artist and, and he'll sign them. Mm -hmm. So I, I immediately, the first thing that I told uh, Li Xin to do was to do um, the signature page, which features uh, oh, yeah. the King of the Silver, Silver River. River. So yeah, um, just so the readers, so I refresh the readers here, each book in the Heritage series opens with a chapter that is different from the overall arching storytelling narrative of the of the actual characters of the Olmsfords or or you know right or you know so um, so the first book had Cogline you know as the signature page because he is the opening chapter in Scions for Druid the opening is of course the King of Silver River creating quickening. Mm -hmm. So in here, so here we have here here we have the King of the Silver River. So you want to talk a little bit about the King of the Silver River at all? I mean, he's one of the most important characters in the series. He is, and he he appears periodically, but not not regularly uh, as a figure. Um, he is godlike. Um, he has uh, powers that transcend what anybody else has, but he is also uh, fairly inactive. He's more of a steward than he is anything else. Um, and I think of our uh, thoughts about uh, the New Testament form of God uh, as he's portrayed and thought about that was kind of the way I wanted to do it. I didn't want to make an all-powerful being uh, right. with this character. I wanted it to be more of a steward and a caretaker and a dispenser of favors and help where it's needed, uh, which is much, much more New Testament anyway. Um, and it's also... This, these same things appear in other religions too, so it's not like I invented this. Um, but I, I like that idea. So he tends these gardens and the gardens appear and disappear at times to various people. He comes to the characters in the books on and off uh, to dispense favors or to uh, offer uh, suggestions or to uh, make clear something that needs to happen and somebody needs to do it, that sort of thing. So he's more of a, of a, of a, of a steward, uh, I guess it would be, than anything. Yeah, I, I think uh, our artist captured that well here. Mm -hmm. And if I remember right, the last thing, the last thing that the King of the Civil River does to create quickening is to grab a dove mm -hmm. to use as her beating heart. And so... Mm -hmm. Uh, the artist picked up on that and felt very strongly that the dove should be should be in it should be in it and and yeah. so I really love this and it's almost like the dove is a light source here which yeah I, it is so the focus is definitely that's what you see right off the bat because it's it's brighter than the surroundings or the figure of the king of the silver river and it, there's a feeling of of cradling and caring for that dove in the picture yeah uh, which is what he's doing because uh, quickening is a daughter of sorts to him and uh, somebody he has looked after and is going to sacrifice to the cause that needs to be fulfilled with going to uh, Elvist and, and uh, dealing with the Stone King. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I love it. So this is a signature page artwork that's on the signature pages. So that's where this, this, this particular piece is yeah. used. It'll be good there. Uh, let's see here. I really like this next one, and I and I want I might have I might have to get a print of this um, from from Li Xin because I just I love it so much. Mm. Yeah. So you That's know, in, in your in your Shannara series, you you always have uh, you know you have the main characters, and most of them at some time or another have a mentor of some kind that kind of helps guide mm -hmm. them in some way, and in this situation. Walker is severely in need of mentorship because he's so rebelling against becoming a druid and mm -hmm. taking up Alanon's charge that he needed an equally strong mentor to counter that, and that's and that's in Cogline. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I I love what the 
that the artist captured here. This is, of course, after Walker has demolished his own arm and he's in store lock trying to be healed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very powerful. I just love how he captured Walker. the stone aspect still down here on his arm. Yeah, that was, that's, you know, um, the, the, the character of, uh, of Walker uh, was deliberately created uh, to be a contrast uh, to Al-Anon. And Al-Anon was always so sure about everything and always so in control and always, you know, uh, able to defeat whatever came against him. Walker doubts everything and doesn't even want to be this druid figure that he has been told he, he will be uh, and doesn't want any part of what's going on. And slowly that re during the course of the series that breaks down and it changes. But he is always more of a bystander, a reluctant participant than, than, than uh, and, and less convinced of his own abilities than Al-Anon was. Yeah, I think um, maybe tomorrow uh, on the Terry Brooks community uh, on Facebook, I'll, I'll post a poll about who's your favorite Druid, uh, and I'll put Al-Anon and Walker. And I'm I'm betting that Al-Anon will win, but by a slim margin, because there's a lot of, a lot of readers out there like myself who I, I always found Walker to be the more intriguing character because, mm -hmm. because of the conflict that he had inside his own heart about everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I think I think it's pretty important that uh, there be that contrast in thirty books <laughs> in the Druids. Yeah, and so there was some something of an effort made to let the Druids have their own identities and to stand apart from one another. They were all effective and all ineffective in different ways, uh, and that that needs to be. That's kind of the nature of leaders, anyway. Right. Uh, things we like and things we don't are always on view. So to have that contrast is really important. Yeah. All right, there is Walker and Cogline. Now, let's go over here to Quickening. This one actually happens fairly early in the book too. Mm -hmm. So there we have, um, I don't know if you've seen, I might have sent you the final of this one, but this is- uh, I don't think so. Quickening and PL. PL. And I believe this is in Colhaven when they meet for the first time. Mm -hmm. And she wakes up and he's sitting next to her and he realizes when she starts talking to him, he realizes what kind of danger she poses. Like Rimmer Dahl tells yeah. him, kill her. Yes. Because she has to be killed immediately and he has this revelation of wow i completely understand why she needs to be killed but yeah I'm intrigued i want to know more he wants to know more especially what her magic is because of course he has right. the steel right so yeah it's a case uh, a case of uh one character understanding the other uh but it not being reversed uh she understands him he doesn't understand her. Right. And that is the dynamic between them for the course of the book. Um, and the, the results that I'm not going to talk about for those who haven't read the book right. are fairly striking as to how that resolves itself. Uh, and I'm, I'm always interested in that kind of aspect in characterization. Uh, what things drive characters what things do they struggle to overcome or understand or come to terms with? Because these are the things about people in general that interest us. You know, it's the act itself uh, is very is very less intriguing than the reasons behind it and to the and the and the character that uh, developed that created the result. Uh, at least for me, it's that way. I'm right. always interested in what makes people tick. Sean. And as a new, yeah, and as a new, and as a new writer, and I consider myself a, a very, very young writer. Uh, you know, hearing that is just a good reminder to me about how character always needs to be 
uh, thought out a little bit in advance to understand yeah. your character so that when they, you put them in situations, you have a, a, a good idea of how they would respond and why. I have written all over the place again and again, the same thing that the first thing I do with any character is find out what is their weakness? What is it they're struggling to come to terms with or overcome or find a solution to? Because that's what really interests us. And that's what we want to see in our characters. You know, we don't want them to just waltz onto the screen and be perfect because that's boring. We want to know what are they struggling with? What is it they can't be perfect about? You know, and what is it that tempts them? So that's what I always look for. A little bit off topic, but do you remember the origins of the steel and where it came from? I mean, the well, name the name is easy to figure out because you somebody moved. created this darn thing. It was happened early on, didn't it? It did. Yeah, you created it for Druid of Shannara. <laughs> That's what I thought. Yeah, I, I I don't remember the story anymore though. I'd have to go back and look at the book. Yeah. I have to tell you, the honest truth is, is after 30 books of anything, you're lucky if you can remember who your own name is. Oh, yeah. I, I had to remember a character name, you know, yesterday when I was writing that chapter one of the next book I'm writing. And yeah. it was literally a character from last year. Like, I should have easily been able to remember it. So. But you can't because you're moving around in characters and storylines yeah. so often that uh, you need to go back. And that, cause that's why that's why you and I linked up so well as I immediately turned to you and said, well, you figure this out. Where did this come from? Give me right. a read on <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I was not already not retaining all the particulars of things, especially when the readers are so on top of it um, and it's fresh in their minds. And then they come and say, well, and with on this page and so forth, you did this. Why'd you do that? And I'm thinking, why did I get into this conversation? In the first <laughs> yeah, yeah. Important question. Yeah, I, I, I used to like to say that I was, you know, Shannara's continuity editor with you, you know, yeah, I right. because I, all the books were still fresh in my mind. Right. But, oh, my gosh. Like, I when you ask me questions these days, I have to go hunting in the actual books sometimes you to do. find the answers. <laughs> well, thank God some, one of us is able to do that. <laughs> yeah. your, your mechanics are much uh, sharper and more developed than mine are. I'm still looking at the book you know, and trying to figure these things out, which is the wrong way to go about it. Yeah. Right. So there's quickening and PL there. That's a good one. Another uh, good one. This next one is, uh, I love this next one so much because he, he was such a fun character, is uh, Karisman. Oh, yes. And uh, I actually hmm. spent, a, I spent a lot I of time. Seen this. I spent a lot of time with the artist on this one um to make sure that we got charisman right because you know yeah. you only make a couple mentions of what he looks like and stuff so i had to distill that down right. and then of course the urdas the urdas you know the gnome like yeah. creatures that are up there in the eternal mountains like i needed to capture them in a way that made sense that's pretty good too yeah i, I like, I like this one yeah i like this those the songs the song he's uh music yes. he's making uh, displayed as the notes that are floating down. That's great. Yeah, so many people over the years have asked if he's an offshoot Omsford that has some aspect of the wish song, and it's never stated one way or the other in the book, and I, I kind of like oh. that fact. <laughs> oh, good. New story idea. But the Erdas, the Erdas love his singing, and they're enraptured by it. They're en entranced by it, so I'm like, yeah. okay, well, this is, this is a great illustration for that purpose. Well, it it's a, it's the kind of a trope that has been around a long time. Uh, the singer being able to charm the savage beast or uh, the beautiful uh, songs and notes being able to uh, empower the creatures that can barely talk uh, or whatever, yeah. something of that sort. Uh, and, um, you know, there's a million examples of that in the fairy, in the uh, traditional fairy tales. And, yeah. Uh, so it was pretty easy to come up with the idea. It was, was not a, a struggle. Yeah. So let's see, where do, we, where do I want to go here? We'll go, we'll go this direction because this, these, these last two, I, I'm really rather fond of. Actually, I think you haven't seen, I, I don't think you've seen either of the last two the, in final form. I don't think I have. Um, so this isn't all of them, there's 10 of them, isn't there all together? 
Yeah, there's 11 altogether. 11. If, you include, yeah. if you include the signature page, yep. Okay. Uh, we're showcasing seven of the 11 so that the four out there, when they, people get the books and they see something new, you know? Right. And so here's the Stone King. Um, this isn't the way that I would have done it, but I'm also, I kind of lean towards the how you give a lot of leniency to the artists for them to envision it. Yeah, I think that's the way to do it. You have to trust your people that you're working with. I do trust my artists um, yeah. that uh, create, they're doing their version as they see it. What's wrong with that? When, when the, I when think, the when you know, the, the readers all do that. The readers immediately have their own version mm -hmm. of how the characters look and they may, they make it up in their mind and they may say, oh yeah, well, this doesn't look the way I saw it. And I think that's not bad. Right. It's okay so, to have different versions. I will. I will say a little bit in advance here in in the text in the Druid of Shannara, the Stone King is uh, kind of described initially when Walker and the group uh, come across him, almost in in a similar pose to the Thinker. If you guys know mm -hmm. that sculpture, you know, down like like fist on chin, mm -hmm. and then he moves, and then he and then he rises up. So I look at this picture or this image as after he's risen up and he's oh that's good they're aware so i'll just preface that <laughs> yeah no that's good yeah you get to, uh, the the uh, he has that figure uh, he has that appearance of being something then resembling what you would envision as a stone king uh, kind of a monster uh non-human creature right uh, who has great power and staying ability and so forth and uh so that captures that with a few of the other characters around it. I see Pael in the foreground. Yep. Yeah, they're there. They're all there. Um, yeah, I see that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very powerful. I like the light shining down too. That's yeah, really that's one thing I liked about it. And I I, I stressed um, to Li Xin that the this is inside the stadium, right? It's inside the dome. So there would be yeah. rows, rows of bleachers and stuff more than likely behind. And so he mm -hmm. managed to capture that too. But I really like the light source that he used. Um, there's a contrast, you know, the, the light and the dark that's inside yeah. the King almost. Yep. Everybody in the chat saying how much they love the great use of the light in, in that one, and I can't. Yeah, that's a, it's very, very, uh, I don't want to say illuminating because that's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's very cleverly done, I would say, uh, rather about how that they've rendered the, the Stone King, who is, I, uh, you know. I will say that uh, later on in the book that uh, the artist also painted the confrontation between the Stone King and Quickening, which I, yes. I, really, I really like that one too. So yes. I'm not showing you that one. You're going no, to that one. have the book uh, to see that one. Uh, let's see. So here, here, so here's two more and then we'll get to some questions and then we'll get you out of here to dinner. How's that sound? <laughs> okay. Oh, you're not talking to me. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm talking to you. Yeah. Um, I'm talking to everybody actually. So here is Walker at the end of the book uh, when he's about to use the Black Elf Stone for its originally intended purpose. And the colors in this, I, I just, I'm in love with. Ah, yeah, that's very dramatic. So that's Walker here. Yeah. You know, and that's supposed to be that's supposed to be a paranor that's paranor yep up on its plateau yeah and he's using the stone to bring it back into the you see the mists bring it back into here. the world after it's been yeah yeah i just love the colors the greens and the purples and the blues and the light source and you know this this one character whose whose entire purpose is to bring back the druids and mm -hmm this immense task that is before, even though he's bringing back Paranor, the task before him is still much larger than even he knows at this point. Yeah, the artist has really captured the idea of it being a magical, wondrous moment that he's created this thing or done something here in, in the rendering of this uh, castle and this uh, setting. 
uh, that uh, tells you right away that this is something very special and that this is going to have a major impact on the story. Yeah, and I loved the I loved the uh, the architecture up here for Paranor. Like that's what I see in my mind. One yeah. really kind of large spire, and then you got the keep, and then you know got the turrets and and everything, right. parapets right. and whatnot. It's good. It's yeah. good. It's a good rendering. I love that. You know, it's always interesting to see what artists will come up with. I mean, you envision it as a writer in a particular way, but the, very seldom do the artists give it back to you in the same way, which yeah. I think is exciting. Right. They do it back to you differently the way they see it. And you say, yeah, I, 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 that's right. You know, that's good. Yeah, that was a, what was fun about uh, my graphic novel that comes out this year, just seeing how Nate Taylor envisioned yeah. the characters from what was in my head. Like, I just let Nate go because it's not my, it's not my place to tell him, no, that's wrong. Oh, you know? no. I think that's a mistake. I think giving too many instructions to an artist is always a mistake because after all, they're creative personalities. They're creative people. They've done this before. They don't necessarily need you to tell them how to do something. Right. They, better that you let them envision it in the way that they see it. Yeah. I will say one thing here that um, our artist, who's very good, had a had a bow and arrow case here on Walker. Oh, right. And he would never have that because it takes two hands to do that. Yeah, right. <laughs> So those this are the little things better. where as an art director, like I will have an artist change something if it makes sense, but yes. um, yeah. Well, those are all great. And then here's one more. So, and this leads into the Elf Queen of Shanra, which there's, I think there's one, only one chapter in Druid that deals with Wren. That's right. And Well, I'm not sure about that, but there's, there's not more, much more than one. Yeah, and so this is uh, Ren meeting the Adder Shag to discover mm -hmm. where the elves have gone and how best to find them. And so here is the, your, your first look at Ren. And uh, gosh, should I, I want to announce who the artist is for the next book, but I probably shouldn't. We'll save that for another time. <laughs> save that. We'll just talk about it a little. It's a major artist that all of you know and love. And um, they have connections to me. And so that'll give you a, a big hint <laughs> for who's gonna be doing their artwork for Elf Queen of Shanra. But here is Ren in Druid of Shanra. So here's Ren meeting the Adder Shag who is in the basement of this, I can't remember yeah. if it's a tavern or pub or something. Yeah, it's a tavern uh, uh, um below a tavern, something like that um, in, I can't remember what town she's in now, but it's got a Is name. It, it might be Grimpen Ward now that I think Grimpen about it. Grimpen Ward, that's yeah. it, good memory. I like this uh, because <clears throat> the uh, Addershag doesn't look overpowering even though she's a witch and she's got a lot of power. And Wren looks much stronger in this rendering than how she appears frequently in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, but she has to be given what she's going to be required to do. Uh, and here she looks very much the way I would think of her as being, you know, uh, she's, she's got tendencies towards uh, almost male behavior in her, uh, in what she has to do. You know, she's a woods woman. Uh, she's a woods girl. She's a rover. Um, she, yeah. She's a rover and she's lived the rover's life. So she's rough and tumble. And she knows how to take care of herself. Um, and she's certainly going to get tested out before the end of this book in every way possible. Yeah. Uh, but uh, she ha has a lot of strength. And uh, this captures that nicely. One of our uh, chat people, Susan, said, I love all the artwork. And that makes me happy. <laughs> yeah. I, th I, th I love it, too. I agree with her. I think this has turned out to be quite good. Yeah. So, and there's four more that I'm not going to show, but um, yeah, this is, that, that's, that these, this is the artwork for Druid of Shannara. I, I love all of it. Uh, yeah, I'm I going to have too. a couple of them on my own personal wall, so. <laughs> I'm excited to see the finished book myself. Yeah. Yeah, so let's talk about that. So we're going to do, I'm going to end the share here. Okay. Oops, not a new share. I don't want to do a new share. I want to stop this one. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so we're going to do uh, we're going to do the same thing that we did 
uh, with the science of Shannon and Indomitable, where we will uh, we'll have a regular edition. And that regular hardcover edition will have these these paintings in it as black and white uh, interior art. So, and that will be the same price as the science one is. But the the prices have actually considerably gone up since uh, we did scions initially, and so I hate to say that, but the prices for Druid, you know, the limited edition is going to be two hundred dollars, and then uh, the letter edition will be the same at five hundred dollars. But uh, the limited edition will have all these full color tippins. Uh, that's that's where the cost of producing these limited editions comes from. It's they're hand tipped, um, so that's that's always uh, you know an expensive part of the process. Yeah. But uh, these books are going to match what we did uh, with Scion. So you guys don't have to worry about meeting stretch goals in a Kickstarter or anything like that. These, these books are going to yeah. be gilded. You know, the limited edition, the letter edition, they're going to be gilded. They're going to have the nice end papers. Uh, you know, they're going to be full color. And so I'm super excited about producing this book. And actually, the artist for Elf Queen, um, she's going to start working. It's a she. Ha, I can say that. It's a she. All, all of you guys in the chat were saying Todd Lockwood, but um, no, it's not Todd. Uh, and so she's going to begin work sometime later this summer for delivery in October, I believe. So we'll be doing uh, the Elf Queen of Shanra early next year, which uh, will kind of speed things up a little bit. We, we That'll will, help, yeah. Because we need to be sped up a little bit. Science took forever to be finished, so... Uh, the files well, there were all kinds of things that we couldn't control exactly uh, that caused that to happen so uh, it isn't like we sat back and said well let's make them suffer a little before we give them the book <laughs> that's right we, there was there were <laughs> distribution and paper and ink and uh, everything you can possibly think of all caused by covid in part yeah uh, or at least impacted and uh, it just threw us for a loop uh, we thought we were going to just sail right through this in four straight years easy, but that certainly didn't happen. And uh, we'll be lucky if we can get this done uh, in anything resembling that time period. Yeah, right. So let's see. Somebody said, oh, yeah, about numbered and lettered copies, we'll we be able to match and do a pre-order. Uh, you know, I'm going to send for you guys that own the lettered editions of Scions, I will be sending a, a link with a passcode so that you guys can order that directly without having to worry about other people stealing your copy. And yes, I will match numbers and letters. So there you go. There's that information. Uh, and I will share, I might as well share right now. It's five o'clock. Uh, do you have a couple more minutes you can last? Who, me? Yeah. We got, we, haven't, got, we haven't even got the question. We're not yet. going anywhere. Yeah. Okay. We just keep going. Okay. So uh, so I'm going to share that the the date for ordering the Druid of Shan or limited editions, the regular editions will be March 15th. So here in two weeks, you'll be able to order your copies. And as I said, like all the files are done. We're mm -hmm. actually having the beta, but we're having the, the interior of the book beta read right now. So that'll be done here in, oh, I don't know, probably four or five days, I'd say. Uh, artwork's done. Uh, you're getting the signature pages to sign this weekend when we see each other at Emerald City Comic Con. Yeah. So yeah, so we're looking at being able to send this off to the printer and bindery uh, probably at the end of this month. So that's much faster than Scions, and we're looking probably at a late summer or early fall ship date, which is kind yeah. of fun. So those of you who uh, follow my work, though, you know that March 15th was the original date that my Kickstarter for the King Killing Queen was going to go live. Uh, we've decided to push that back just a month in order to give a little bit more time to make sure that this is done the best way possible. And right. Uh, you know, so, and that's something that happens with Kickstarters every once in a while. So, and I'm totally fine with it. I, I'm actually getting advanced reader copies, probably not the end of next week, but early the next week. Mm -hmm. So those advanced reader copies are going to go to all these authors out there who I'm hoping to get blurbs from. So that's an important part of the process. I need to give them time to read the book and either love it or hate it, whatever they decide to do. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> Okay, let's get to some questions here. Yeah, so March 15th, mark your calendar. So it'll be up on the signed page. I actually have a banner already made that'll that'll go up um, on the signed page once we're done here. Uh, let's get to some questions here. Cindy Beeler, uh, does Terry think that he will make it to Canada on tour this coming year? Uh, I think I'm supposed to go to Calgary. Okay. But I've kind of forgotten. <laughs> It's, it's still a long it's, way it's away. Still 
listening or not. Yeah. But I hope, uh, you know, I hope someone will, will let me know if I'm supposed to be there so I actually show up. Uh, yeah. I am. Uh, but yes, I think I'm supposed to go to Calgary. That's probably the only place I will be in Canada this year. I'll be I'll be updating your website tomorrow, actually, with some events okay. that you have planned for this summer. Uh, but right. Terry's tour for book three of Viridian Deep, we won't know details on that until late summer, early fall. So, uh, yeah, just keep your eyes open on the website. Yeah. Uh, Matt Muller says, I recently finished Street Freaks. Enjoyed it a lot. Will there be more books from that world? One hopes. One hopes. One has to find the time. Uh, it may sound like I have tons of time to write, but actually it's all getting filled up at the present. Uh, but yes, I would like to do a sequel to that book and I kind of know what it's going to be. Uh, so keep up the good faith and we'll see what we can do. Yeah, your next two or three years, you're kind of locked in with what you want to do. So it yeah. depends. I guess it depends really upon how... How quickly, how, quickly, I write. how quickly those books happen, right? If you write one of those books in four months, I could easily see you finishing. Yeah, off, doing the other. You know? yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. Um, let's see, what else is there? Uh, Kevin Fidicaro asks, is there, any, is there any way to reserve a specific number? Through coincidence, every special edition I've ordered has been to 13. Five separate books, all numbered the same. Kevin, 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 that's not coincidence. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is that is either me or Becky looking up each individual order and doing a search in a spreadsheet and making sure that you get your matching number. So yes, we will end up matching your number. That's what we do because it's good customer service. Ah, uh, my very clever minions. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Brian Gressler uh, asks, do you have an anticipated ship date for Druid of Shanra? I kind of already answered that. It's We're looking probably late, late summer or early fall for that one. Um, ooh, uh, Louis Rulo Johnston asks, what are you reading, Terry, right now? Nothing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that. I know. This is the first time I haven't been reading something in quite some time. Uh, so it, it kind of catches me by surprise. I have a uh, book called uh, The Atlas Paradox sitting on my shelf waiting for me to follow up the, par the uh, Atlas Six uh, by a young writer, I think out of Canada, actually. I'm trying to remember, she's out of Britain. Mm. Uh, but I was fascinated with that book, so I'm reading the sequel. Uh, also doing a sequel by uh, uh, N.K. Jemison that just came out, as a matter of fact. I read the first book and now I'm intrigued enough. I wanna see where she's gonna take it. Um, I have a, um, a John Connolly book that has been out for about, I don't know, four or five months that I haven't got to yet. I'm kind of holding back on that because I love his work. Uh, and I've got to read that. I've got a uh, Maggie Stiefvater. Oh yeah. Uh, the latest book, the last book, I think it is in that last latest series. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, I have TJ Crone's Conan. What's TJ Clune? Clune, thank you. Yep. TJ Clune's latest book, uh, use it with the word puppets in it, um, and they're robots. So I'm imagining that's going to be pretty wonderful. Uh, that my daughter stole from me. Uh, <laughs> You're gonna get it well, back. She, we just asked if she could have it, and I let her take it to read it, and I'll read it after she gives, gives it back to me here in a few weeks. Um, so there's a lot of things out there. There's more too, but uh, that's the ones I can remember right off the top of my head. I think that's a good list. Um, I was it's going, good list. Yeah. I was going through Ask Terry, uh, the Ask Terry questions, just to like go back and look and revisit some. Yeah, some yeah. Things. And I, you, at one point, you said you read. Oh, what was it? You, you said you read like 90 books a year, and Judine reads like 130 books a year. And I'm just that's like, about right. Wow, that's just impressive. Yeah. Well, you, when when you're when you're elderly like we are, you get a lot of reading time. Ah, <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, I can't wait to be elderly. <laughs> well, that's one of the perks. You can oh, okay. uh, you, you can stop being uh, committed to your career and say, well, my career career is here, and and. Uh, uh, so right now I get to do what I want to do, and that's what I want to do, and that's nice. what Judy wants to do. Good. Our friend Bill Cornett asks, what about slipcases for Druid? Yes, there will be slipcases and clamshells for the Druid of Shanra limited editions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're doing all the right things, I think. Yeah. 
Um, Tom Tobison asked, Terry, which character do you get asked most about? Wow. I have no idea most about. That's a good question. I, I, you've never been asked that question. I mean, when you've got 30 books, I get a lot of questions about a lot of the different characters. Um, obviously, I get a lot of questions about al yeah. uh, and about the whole the whole uh, sort of Shannara series and the characters in there, but it's hard to say when they're, it, it depends on what's hot at the moment, I guess. Um, and um, I just, I couldn't say, I really couldn't. Uh, there's such a widespread of questions about so many different characters and I've never tracked that. So I just really have no way of doing anything other than Yeah, I would, I would say most, if, if there was any one character that people probably asked the most about, being the one that filtered a lot of those questions, you know, through over the years, it would, it would be Al-Anon. Yeah. Um, but I would also say it would be Ben Holiday, right? After Al-Anon. Um, oh, yeah. There are a lot of questions ben. about Ben Holiday and what he's up to and so on and so forth. But since I haven't read, written a book in 10 years in that series, uh, that's kind of fallen by the wayside in terms of having an immediacy attached to it. Because yeah. there's nothing coming and there's, you know, it's sort of like that's over and done with at this point. And it's yesterday's news. So I don't get the, the there is the immediacy isn't there to ask about those characters. Anymore. Right. Uh, Except when they're talking about the movie. I just finished, see, Karen Cobley asks, I just finished my rereading of the series. I love it so much, but wonder how you come up with all the names because they fit so well. Ah. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just jump in here real quick and say, you know, Terry moved to Seattle in the late 80s or mid 80s, somewhere around there. And then all of a sudden we got PL as a name and the steel as a name. <laughs> <laughs> so can you talk a little, just a little bit about names and where they come from for you? Well, I steal them from everywhere, as I tell everybody. Um, I see really great names attached to street signs and storefronts and uh, towns and uh, strange places. And I think they have served their purpose in those places. So now it's time for me to use them. Yeah. And then I graft them out of there and move them over to uh, use as characters or whatever, or, or creatures or something like that. Um, and sometimes names get made up just because they're a combination of, of names I've been saving. And I think, oh, look at this fit, the way these two fit together and do it that way. It, it's a, it is a struggle. It's becoming more of a struggle as time passes, as a matter of fact. And some, I change names more often these days than I used to. I didn't used to change names ever, but these days I'm changing them fairly regularly just because uh, my commit, commitment to the names isn't as strong, I think, as it used to be. And you don't uh, travel as much as you used to because of COVID. I don't travel. So, no, so you're not, I'm not seeing... traveling at all right now. Yeah, 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 exactly. So I don't go to the uh, exotic parts of Canada and England and, and uh, Europe that I used to go to. Uh, our good friend Ricky Mole. Oh, Rick. <laughs> we'll probably we'll we'll definitely see hey, him times this year. Yeah. He, he asked the question here that is on the mind of a lot of people, so I might as well just get it out of the way. Um, will we ever get a series about Gallophile? Mm. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Who's Gallophile? Mm. Oh, yeah. I know who it is. I I'll, know, remind just... I'll remind you after this. I will remind you after this. <laughs> Um, I am working on new projects all the time in just about every way you can imagine. And I play around with ideas that involve characters that whose story has never really been told uh, or has never been told in, in, the, in a complete fashion. So, uh, you're yeah, open, you know, you're, open to the, you're, op you're open to the idea if the right story comes around. I'm open to the idea. Well, you know, I, I said I was done with the Shannara series. Uh, but that was only for, you know, the time that I said I was done for the Shanna series. And uh, I'm, I'm not saying I won't go back to it ever or won't do anything with it again ever. Uh, I'm just saying that for the immediate three years or four years that has been here since I finished up uh, The Last Druid, uh, it has been gone. I haven't thought about and done anything with it other than occasional, you know, idea that crops up. So we'll see. Right. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. That question's too long. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Don't be so wordy. 
as I get told. Now well, somebody again. asked, is there any hope after the end of Shannara? <laughs> yes, there's hope. There's always hope. <laughs> you know, the only thing I ever said about Shannara that I, is graven in stone was that I was never going to do a book that came after anything I had already written. Right. I said, it stops with the last druid. That's it for, for me. Uh, anything I do has to fill in the gaps where the gaps are there to be filled in or a spinoffs or whatever like that. That's that's pretty much my been my uh, my song and dance for the whole time. Yeah, and you 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 have plenty of canvas to play around with and in between yeah. series and stuff. So that's that's a good thing. Yeah. I'm not going to write an immediate sequel to The Last Steward. I can guarantee you that. Yep. <clears throat> Um, Robert Dixon asks, I was wondering with the publications of the Shannara novels via Grim Oak, any chance of Landover coming to Grim? Yeah. I don't know. We haven't talked about it. Actually. I would, you know, my dream, my dream for the Landover series is having Charles Vess on, on the Landover series because his work is so... That would be fairy, cool. Fairy tale-ish. Um, yes. I, I just, I, I would love to see what he would do with Willow and the Paladin. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are reasons to think about doing something like that. It's just that we have a limited amount of time and energy. So we have focused right. on these next four books in the Shannara. And then after that, it's start all over again. And we'll think about it and see where uh, the most popular interest lies and, and try to work on it from there. Yep. Yep. Totally agree with that. Yeah. And of course, if anything happens with, uh, you know, Hollywood and Landover. If anything happens, yeah, if they make a movie in Hollywood, I'll bet we'll be doing something. We'll, we'll definitely be doing something then, regardless of <laughs> how many books we already have to do. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it'll be, it'll be exciting, I'm sure. Uh, let's see, you talked a little bit about Shannara, the adaptation on TV, and you already talked about any plans to adapt any of your other novels. We just kind of talked about that. Well, you know, yeah, again. We're, oh, yeah. we're completely swamped at this point with getting uh, heritage done. Once we get that done, we'll take another look and see where we should go. Yep. Uh, this is uh, from an anonymous attendee, but I have a feeling it's Austin Butler asking this. <laughs> how, do you, how do you feel about Austin Butler and his accolades with the movie Elvis? <laughs> well, uh, Judine and I will admit that we love Austin Butler. He was the best guy. Uh, when uh, he was on the show, and uh, I have great respect for his uh, talent and uh, his career choices. Uh, I thought he was fabulous as Elvis. I thought I can't imagine anybody else doing the job he did. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I hope I would love to work with him again sometime uh, if the opportunity ever came came up, but I think he's going to be way too big for me to ever work with him again. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, just a decent, good and talented guy. That's what he is. Uh, let's see. Kurt Dog asks, will there be any extra items to pre-order with the book like there was with the Scions Kickstarter? Yes, Kurt Dog, there will be. We'll be doing another uh, artist portfolio, so the Colossal cards. And uh, I just hired an artist to do the coins. So we're definitely going to have a portfolio and coins. And of course, we'll probably have, you know, the paper bookmark and we'll probably do a, a, yeah. a metal bookmark too. You know, yeah. Just to have the That's same great. stuff. Um, let's see, Robert asked one already. Let's see. Oh, that's a good question. Henry Wetzel. I get, I get asked this question all the time too. Uh, Henry Wetzel asks, will there be any additional books that are annotated, like the annotated Sword of Shanra? That, wow. that was a request from Del Rey, so um, that's not really up to us to decide, right? Yeah, I think uh, it's probably a long shot, but uh, as, it, as the, the problem is, is the, the logical choice is to do, Shan, to do Sword of Shanra again, but I, I think that would be silly. Yeah, we would do uh, Elfstones. So picking we a book to do that with would be something of a challenge. I guess we could do it with elf stones. We could do it with elf stones. Background with that, that we could do it. We could also but, do it. I, I, an annotated Magic Kingdom for sale sold would, you know, Magic Kingdom, yeah, for sale sold would be fun. And running with a demon, an annotated one of both those. Those, demon, both those books are so personal to you. They're very personal stories. Uh, there's a lot of Terry Brooks in both those books. My life and history, as well as my thinking. Yeah. So yeah, it's a possibility. Uh, it's not in the works, but it's a possibility. 
Let's see, Henry asks, will there be any maps available from Scions to purchase? Uh, no, but Henry, you can, uh, why don't you write me an email, Henry, and I can put you in touch with Russ Charpentier. He's the, uh, the cartographer that produced the maps for most of Terry's recent Shannara work. Right, right. And he, has, and he has a way that you can buy several different versions of the maps that he's done for the Four Lands and outside of the Four Lands even, even in the Forbidding. So yeah, write me an email, Sean at SeanSpeakman.com. Uh, let's see. In every post office in America, you can find his personal information. That's right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Jonathan Whittier asks, how long did it take you to write? Some of these are fast, so this is good. How long did it take you to write The Sword of Chandra? Oh, like seven years. There you go. Fast On and off. <laughs> I wrote it three different times, so uh, it was a long haul. And I was, a, I was a new writer with no experience and no real skill set that was in place at that point. So uh, I always thought I was pretty lucky just to get that book published. But um, yeah. it, it was, it was, I would never want to take that much time to write a book again, I can tell you. Yeah. It was seemingly endless. Let's see. Craig Toe asks, how often do you not know where a book is going to end? Not very often. I always, I always, I almost always have it worked out. Sometimes it changes in the course of the writing of the book. I will admit that. And uh, the, but I usually have an ending in mind right from the beginning, just because I like to be writing towards something in this, in the making of the book. Uh, let's see. Melissa Olmstead asks, what character has been the most challenging to write? Hmm. Oh my God. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, there are a lot of them that are challenging. It's always difficult to write villains for one thing. Uh, villains are difficult because, you know, you want to do more than just make them bad people. Right. Uh, I'd, I'd say, I think maybe uh, because I wrote about her so often that Grianne Olmsford was the most difficult because I wrote her in three sets of books and in each one she changed dramatically in the books, the set, as well as from a set to set uh, because we were chronicling her life from being a girl to being an older woman. Right. Um, and uh, that, that was tough uh, because she had to go through so many tough times and become so many things she didn't even want to become and that's always hard to write. Yeah, she doesn't have a standard arc, character arc. She does not. Her arc is very interesting. I mean, that's oh. one of the reasons why I love her so much. I know, she's a good character and I like doing it, but I don't think I could ever do with that again. Well, I know I can't because I wouldn't live long enough. <laughs> Funny guy. <laughs> uh, Lynn Kaufman asks, how do you choose the artist who reads your audiobooks? Well, I'm given a selection uh, by my editor for these books. I have a specific editor that does these books and uh, uh, one of my favorite people. Uh, and she uh, sends me a set of readings and descriptions and material that will help me decide what to do. And I listen to them and look at them and so forth. And then based on that, we have some discussions about which one might work best and in what context and so forth. And then uh, I usually say, this is the one I prefer. And he, she usually goes along with me, but it, it can vary. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly my experience. I get, a, I get three or four um, samples yeah. and reading, reading my book. The samples are them reading my actual book. And then I right. pick who, who I think is the best person. It ha you know, it has a lot to do with your vision of your character, more so than the artistry does because I envision the way the character would speak. And I usually get one or two out of say six or seven yeah. that immediately sound right to me for this character. So I usually go with those two and then depending on you know what's what, uh, we go that way or we don't. Melissa Sanchez asks, how many books are going to be in the Viridian Deep series? Well, for the moment, three. Okay. The, the pr prospect of continuing to write them down the road is going to be kept there, but I'm not going to immediately go into another set of these books right away. I need to have a, ch I need to have a change. Good. All right. There you go. <laughs> uh, 
Brian Kressler, how dare you? <laughs> As a lawyer, are you able to do certain things for yourself that another author would have to pay an agent or lawyer for? If so, do you offer these services to Sean? <laughs> Sean and I are, are frequently offering services to each other, but they don't have anything to do with my being a lawyer. Yeah. Right. Tell you that. Uh, Usually they have to I, do with I having think, dinners. Uh, I think that mostly uh, the being a lawyer part of it helps me understand the legal documents that I have to read and approve. Uh, uh, but um, you know, I, I think it's that's fairly limited these days. What I remember about actually practicing law by this time is, you know, minuscule, because I've been out <laughs> of the business for 40 years or something. <laughs> it's been and that's why, I like, years, you. I, that's why I like you so much, because you're not a lawyer anymore. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've, I've got so many more friends now. Um, no, I just, that's all behind me now. So I don't spend a lot of time with trying to do the tough stuff. I, I have lawyers who can do that. And I have you know, other people that work with me, uh, tax people and so on and so forth that say, yeah, all right, well, this is the way you should go or whatever. Right. And um, I try to make, take advantage of their expertise and, and try to shelve mine where it belongs on the high shelf. Here's a, here's a very serious question. This is from uh, Lewis Johnston. Hi, I'm 11 and writing my story. The Sword mm -hmm. of Chanter was the second book I ever read. Do you have any advice for publishing a first book? Well, I could give you advice, but all the advice I have these days about publishing is 35 years old. So it's not of much use because publishing has changed so dramatically that I would literally, if not, if I were not already published, have to start all over again in how I would approach things. Yeah. Uh, it was much simpler when I was doing this than it is now. And the parameters for how you get published and how you're, a, a typical example is when I started out, I was told up front, you will not be involved in publicity. Yeah. You will not be going to any bookstores or doing any public things until you've done three books. That was my editor. After you've done three books, we'll review the situation. But there was no expectation that I was to do public appearances. Now there's every expectation that you're supposed to do it. And you're supposed to be in charge of your own publicity to a large extent. So that's, that's changed everything. And I, I'm not sure I would know even what to do. I'd have to learn it all over again. Yeah, even, even so since I'm sorry, I can't help with that. But uh, the best thing to do is read the trades and uh, to uh, talk to other writers about who are younger than I am and more new to the business about how they do it. I think if you write to most, find an author you love and write a letter to that author. Pick somebody who's new to the field though and ask them what they can help you with with how to find, get a book published or what you need to do these days in order to make that happen. Yeah. Um, and go to, a, go, to a, go to the cons, go to Emerald City Comic Con and go to a, uh, talk about this very thing. They always have some, some of this sort of thing going on. Yeah. Um, and there's usually a con somewhere near wherever you are. Where is he from? Does it say? Oh, no, it doesn't okay, say. We don't know. But if yeah. there's something near you, then that's, that's a good way to do it. And, and just learn by, by uh, listening to what other writers have to say about what they do. Yep. But I'm an old dog now, so I'm, I'm not as savvy about what to do these days as I once was. Let's see, Scott Slind. Oh, yeah, Scott. by sometimes the magic works. Yeah, yeah sometimes the magic <laughs> works. Right. Read that and that'll help. Uh, let's see, Scott Slind or Slindy. I don't know how you pronounce your name, Scott. I'm sure we're going to meet you in Washington, D.C. here this year when we're in town for the convention oh, there. But, right. Uh, which book or Imaginary, series? Which book or series is Mr. Brooks uh, that Mr. Brooks has written was his most rewarding? Oh my God. Let's see, which one paid the most? Sword. Let me think. <laughs> I, I don't know. Every one of them, everything I've ever written has been exceedingly rewarding, uh, but usually in different ways. Sometimes it's a matter of the fact that you got the book down and it turned out the way you wanted it to. Right. Sometimes it's the fact that you overcame your own self and managed to get it done in the way that it should have been done. Uh, sometimes it's a sense that you really accomplished specific things with this book that you didn't feel you may have accomplished with another book. I mean, there's all kinds of ways in which a book can be rewarding. Just getting it 
done and in print and seeing it published and on a bookshelf is a huge, huge, great feeling. I take, I take great pleasure from that every time. Let's see. We won't ask Heck, that. I even enjoy seeing Sean's books in print. Oh, I love that too. <laughs> <laughs> That's our hope. And they deserve to be out there. Uh, Hunter, uh, ooh, that's a good last name, D Dom Domingu. I like that last name, Hunter. We like that name, right, Hunter? Okay. Uh, what's the condition of the rest of the world outside the Four Lands? Is there are there other civilizations like the Four Lands that believe they are the only parts to survive the Great Wars? Well, there were in a couple of my uh, series that I wrote about. Uh, uh, one of them being uh, the Heritage of Shannara. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, particularly in book three, The Elf Queen of Shannara, uh, all of it took place in a place that uh, was based on Hawaii. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we have moved uh, outside the country, uh, the four lands rather, I should say, on many occasions uh, for one reason or another and through one group or another. And, um, you know, uh, sometimes I depict things the way I see them uh, in our world and sometimes I don't. It really varies on what I'm trying to accomplish. It has to do with how I see the story developing. Uh, Matthew Clark asks, is there a plan to update the world of Shan or a companion book? I get that I question know. a lot. I get that question a lot. I know uh, th that hasn't been talked about for a while. Uh, and uh, we have three versions right now uh, there's, I don't know, if the books, if the books are no longer selling, that would be an impetus for the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the publishing house to say, well, they're not selling now, so why should we buy, you know, put out any more? Yeah. And I haven't talked to them about it for a long time either, so I, I'm as guilty as anybody else. I suppose I better make that a question uh, to uh, put to them and say, what are the thoughts? And I, I don't know uh, if any of the people who've worked on the old ones are available anymore either. Right. I haven't talked to any of them for a while. Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, Bradley Lloyd, how many revisions does a normal does a novel usually go through? Well, it goes through three before it leaves my hands. Myself, my wife, myself. Uh, and then you usually have something to say about this too. Um, being my, you know, on the street reader and yeah. a favorable author. Um, and then it goes back to the publishing house. And usually there are, usually almost always, there are suggestions for revisions, sometimes once and sometimes twice. And then I get galley proofs where I will see the book in printed form before it gets to printed form and have to make changes in that in order to bring it into sync with everything as it should be. And then it finally goes out. And that's pretty much the case, although sometimes you can get more complicated. You have to like uh, rewrites and you have to like uh, doing uh, authorial uh, improvements on your work. And I do. So that helps me. Yeah. Alan Sharp asks, will there still be a rare version of the Druid of Shannara like we had on the Kickstarter for Science? Yes, Alan, there will be a rare edition that you'll be able to buy. And I'll be in contact with all of you rare edition owners. Um, I can't believe some of the, the money that you guys spend on the rare editions, but I understand because they're genuine leather and they look really nice on the shelf. So, uh, yes, I will be in contact. Yeah. Uh, Kurt Dog asks, do you yourself have a record of which number or letter on these books? Yes, I have a record. I have a spreadsheet that I keep. <laughs> Sean has records of everything. I Trust do. me. He's in control. Uh, Kevin asks, what time, Eastern time, will the pre-order start? That'll be 2 p.m. East Coast time on March 15th. Uh, Zachary, when we pre-order, will it charge us immediately or only when the books begin to ship? It'll charge you immediately. Uh, and the reason for that is a very simple one. We need the money so that we can pay the printers and binderies and artists and all that, the money that they're due up front. <laughs> yeah, just the only way we can do it. <clears throat> um, let's see, what else we got here? Um, a lot of these we've answered, so that's good. Well, I have to leave in the next few minutes. Yes, you do. Um, I'm going through these, and there's only 14 left, so I'm just going through real quick. Okay. 
Uh, I can handle that. Uh, you kind of talked about this before, but I'll ask it real quick. Uh, Alan Cheeseman asks, there's talk about rebooting The Lord of the Rings with Warner Brothers. Any discussions about rebooting a Shannara series or movie? No. <laughs> no. Well, <clears throat> I will say, I'll say no, not that I can talk about. Yeah, the rights have reverted back to you, though. So that's a good thing, because yeah. that means it's open for anybody and anybody. Yeah, so. yeah. There's interest. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Brianna Lineski asks, does Will Olmsford have a birthday? Oh, God, I don't know. <laughs> it's, Austin it's Austin Butler's birthday. Let's just let's just say that. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Whenever Austin's birthday is, that's it. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Birmingham asks, will you expand on the Landover series? Do you think, uh, leaving this for just a minute, do you think Austin has any idea that my birthday is Elvis's birthday? Oh, that's, it, uh, that's is that true? It's true. Oh, that is such a cool connection for him. <laughs> oh, you need I never to thought him of that before now. I've always joked about it, but me and Elvis and David Bowie. Yeah, you need to send them a again, note. Three, three amigos. All right, so what was that about? Uh... Oh, shoot, I already I already saved it. Oh, uh, Landover. Um, yes. So you've written, she was asking about more more Landover no, stuff. No plans for any more at the present, no. I will say I really quick. Out on it. I'll say really quick though. There's the novels, and then there's two short. There's two short stories in Landover in the Small Magic collection. So if you haven't read Small Magic, there's two Landover short stories in there. Uh oh, and my One cat. Which Sean is very fond of. My cat is saying hi. Hey, oh, cat. there's a cat. This is Winter. Say hi to everybody, Winter. Now you're gonna purr. Save your call. Okay, you can purr on me. Um, Douglas Klein asks, any more omnibus editions coming? Hmm. That's up to Del Rey. Um, we've stalled out on that one too. I think the the last omnibus edition was uh, I think it was about the Ursa Witch and so forth, wasn't it? I think it was Hyde Druid. Yeah, I do it was the last one. So I don't know. There hasn't been any talk of late, uh, but uh, these things t tend to come and go and get interest up again. So right. we'll see. I, I would not. I would say that there's a chance that there'll be something happening. All right, Vincent Rocco asks a question that I don't really want to ask, but he asked it, and it's the only time he's asked a question. Question for Terry: Do you ever see Sean taking over Shannara like Brandon Sanderson did for Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time? I think, frankly, that uh, Sean should be af very afraid that Brandon will try to take over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Brandon wants to do it. That's fine by me. I have my own work going on. I refuse to discuss this until I am closer to death. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm one of those guys, you know, I, when it comes to my writing, like it's my writing, the, the things I'm doing are important to me. I, I would write, I'm kind of like you in this way, like you wrote yeah. Star Wars one time and you're yeah. happy to do so and you don't want to do it again. Yeah. Like if I ever had the chance to write in Shannara, I would probably do it once. And say that was it. And, and I would be, okay, I've, I've done it. That's wonderful. I'm so happy to be, have been given that honor. And then that's it. <laughs> you know, make friends with Amanda. Make friends with Amanda. That's right. <laughs> yeah. um, She'll probably make those decisions after we're gone. For those of you, for those of you who don't know Amanda, Amanda is Terry's wonderful daughter, and she's in the community, and she sees these questions quite often, so she's aware. <laughs> yes, she is. Uh, oh my gosh, this is a hilarious question. I love this. Douglas Klein asks, "Will you ever be creating or narrating another album similar to the one you did for Sword of Shannara?" <laughs> Do you have his name and address both? So I can well, you want to go, you, you want to go take him out? I want to send Guido over to pay him a visit. We all know how much <laughs> you love that album that's still out there. If, and there, how you if there's any justice in the them. world, uh, there's not going to be any more of those albums, period. <laughs> Under any circumstances. I love it. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. We only got four more left here. Um, okay. And that one's not one. That That's the basic. I'm not aware of this album. Good. 
Uh, Craig Toe. I'm not going to even. Oh, see, actually, that that's kind of fun. Alan Cheeseman asks, this is the last question here. Okay. Um, Alan Cheeseman asks, sometimes the magic works is a fantastic story about your writing journey. Any plans for a full biography? Uh, not be, not, well, no, not for me, at least. If yeah. somebody else wants to write a biography, tell them to go ahead. I'm not yeah. doing an autobiography under any circumstances. Yeah, about... Sometimes the magic works is about as autobiographical, I think, as you'll ever get. Yes, I think so. And those of you who haven't read that book, I, I actually, even if you're not a writer, I highly recommend it because some of Terry's stories and anecdotes in that in that uh, book are absolutely magical and wonderful all by, their, by, all by themselves. So it's funny because uh, that's the only book I've ever written that actually gets support from literally everybody. You know, I've got people who don't like my books at all. Yeah. But they like this book. Yeah. You know, and some of them are well known in the field. So <laughs> right. uh, the point is, is that this this book does appeal to everybody because of the nature of the story and the fact that it's really talking about how I learned what I learned to be a writer. If you want to learn how to be a writer, that's probably about as good a book as there is out there yeah. telling you about the things that will influence you and the impacts that you, that you will experience and so forth. So I like it for that reason, but I wouldn't attempt to do it again or do anything following it up, no. Yeah, yeah, I, it was, it's one of those books that I read that fixed like two of, two of the major problems I was having as a writer 20 years ago, It almost 20 years ago. That book fixed them. So um, as a matter of fact, I talked about it yesterday at, at the Skybound interview yeah. um, as a book that inspired me to write. And so that was yeah. kind of, so you can expect that at some point. Um, the check will be in the mail, right? After you. <laughs> <laughs> sure. You can bet. The quote's coming. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so that wraps us up here. Again, uh, the Druid of Shanner limited editions will go on sale March 15th, um, 2 o'clock uh, p.m. for you Eastern folks and 11 o'clock a.m. for you Pacific. We're super excited about this book. It is basically wrapped up and done, so you can expect it this year, which I'm super happy about. And uh, I'll be in touch to all of you in some form or another in the next week about how you can buy your copies. And I'll just say thank you for joining us. This has been super fun, Terry. We haven't done one of these in a while, so it was. It was oh, I miss them really. Yeah, it's kind of fun to get back into it. Yep. So I'll just say thank you, everybody. Uh, I'll say you know thanks to all of you for joining us. Thanks to Terry, yeah. and I'll leave this for Terry to say any final words. Well, I, it's just that I, I, it's kind of a, a, a great joy for me to get actually back on the air and do something like this after three years of uh, the COVID experience when only people were talking about being sick or not being sick. Um, and and I, I do look forward to getting back out in the world and attending a number of conventions this summer and uh, later this spring. And uh, I'm going to uh, try to get to many, as many of you as I can, uh, either now or in the fall when the new book comes out uh, in the local area. So see you all then. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I'll just add on really, really quick here. Uh, Terry shared the cover for book three of the Virid Viridian Deep series with me, and it is gorgeous. It's my favorite cover in 20 <laughs> years for Terry, I think. So I'm happy with it. Yeah, you have a you have a title reveal and a cover reveal coming here in the next couple. Yeah, months. that'll be coming up. So we promise. When we uh, when we get closer to that, I'm sure we'll do another one of these things and talk about uh, the Viridian right. Deep series. But right. Yep. Thank you all. And uh, go have dinner, Terry. You've earned it. I'm leaving. I'm cutting out right now. All right. I'll see you. Bye.